Well, hello, and welcome to the sixth Science of Magic Association uh, conversation on science, magic, and society. Uh, I am Anthony Barnhart, your, your moderator for this event uh, devoted to uh, discussion of creativity. Uh, and I am really excited to bring together today a group of experts, an international panel of experts who have something to say about the topic of magic and creativity. So uh, without any further ado, let me tell you about some of our guest panelists for today. So uh, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Amory Danek today. She's a cognitive psychologist working on issues of human problem solving and creativity. Uh, her main research interest is in how people experience moments of sudden spontaneous insight when a solution idea just pops into their mind seemingly out of the blue. Uh, she has a very long history with the Science of Magic Association. Uh, in collaboration with magician Thomas Fraps, she pioneered the use of magic tricks in the laboratory as problem solving tasks to investigate those aha moments. Uh, she also has done a deep dive into one of my favorite characters from the history of psychology, Wolfgang Kurler. Uh, perhaps she'll share stories about that during our happy hour. That's probably a story for another day. Uh, but Amory has worked in Munich, Chicago, and Heidelberg. Uh, she's a regular speaker at scientific conferences, and she's published more than 20 papers and book chapters. I'm really excited to have Amory here. Uh, next up is Dr. Matt Pritchard. Uh, he is also a longtime contributor to the Science of Magic Association. For the last decade, Dr. Pritchard has worked with schools and universities, presenting his unique science magic and sparking students' wonder. Uh, he previously uh, conducted atomic physics research at Durham University before working at Think Tank Science Museum in Birmingham uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, meanwhile, he spent the last 22 years working as a magician uh, and as an associate of the Inner Magic Circle. In 2020, he won the second place uh, award in the International Best Illusion of the Year contest, and he regularly posts illusions, baffling illusions, creative illusions online. A number of these have even reached viral status. I saw David Copperfield tweet one, I think, last month. Um, he runs the Words on Wonder project, which features a host of interviews with scientists, magicians, philosophers, explorers, and artists to find out what makes them curious. Our next panelist is my dear friend, Dr. Cyril Thomas, a cognitive psychologist at the University of Paris and a magic creator in his own right. Uh, in his research, Cyril uses magic tricks and principles uh, as original tools to better understand our problem solving and perceptual limitations. In the magic domain, he's known for his rubber band magic creations, some of which you saw in the opening video. Uh, creations such as band direction, faith hacker, and psycho bands. Uh, I tell my students that uh, Cyril is smart, handsome, talented, and French, something none of us compete, can compete with, uh, and we shouldn't even try. <laughs> Uh, our final panelist I'm really excited about uh, is my friend David Parr. Uh, last but not least, he's one of my favorite magicians. He is a winner of the coveted Fool Us trophy on the TV show Penn and Teller Fool Us. If you came in a little early, you saw his fooling routine. Um, he created and co-starred in Chicago's longest running magic show. Uh, which is, was chosen by the Travel Channel as one of the top nine magic shows in the nation. He's a frequent performer at the Magic Castle in Hollywood, California. Uh, he's the author of some well-regarded books, a couple of which I have right here, Brain Food, a very creative work, and uh, in collaboration with Robert Neal, uh, The Magic Mirror. Uh, so uh, his latest project is a virtual show called The Sorcerer's Lair, and you will see some of uh, the paraphernalia from that show lining the walls behind him in the video feed. So uh, welcome to all of the panelists. Uh, I would now like to give them the opportunity to introduce themselves to you, uh, starting first with uh, Amory Danek. Take it away, Amory. Hi everyone, um, I'm happy to see the SOMA team and I'd like to thank Tony for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. 
Um, I think I'm here because I'm interested in, in mysteries, not just magic, but also psychological mysteries. And one of the greatest psychological mystery, like in cognitive psychology for the last hundred years has been the phenomenon of sudden insight, which you already mentioned, Tony. And I guess everyone is familiar with this experience that sometimes we have no idea how to solve a problem. And then suddenly, boom, everything is clear and, and the solution just pops into our mind. And it comes with this overwhelming feeling of surprise and joy, the aha experience. So how is this possible? If, if we know how to solve this problem, why couldn't we see it before, just uh, like a second ago, because insight comes so uh, abruptly? Um, psychologists think that the underlying mechanism is actually a creative act it requires a conceptual change, a completely new view. Hmm, I fear Amory's frozen on us. And you make assumptions about the problem. Some of them may be correct, some may be false. And if this initial uh, representation is false, you will not succeed. And now that's where magic comes in because magic, I think is um, our magic tricks are prime examples of false problem representations. And magician, uh, all the magicians do is they manipulate observers uh, assumptions, um, for example, about the objects used. And those assumptions are mostly implicit. So we are not consciously aware of those assumptions that we make them and we are not aware if they are correct or incorrect. So, but to see through a magic trick or to solve this problem, we need to break free from those false assumptions and that's extremely difficult. And in my research, I, I use uh, magic trick videos because I can't do magic myself. So uh, I collaborated with Thomas Fraps who uh, performed those magic tricks for me. And basically the key findings in my research so far, the first one will not be surprising to uh, magicians. A magic trick is extremely difficult to solve. And actually in order to make them solvable as problem solving tasks for my research and not discard all the trials because no one solves them, I had to break this old magician's rule of never showing the same trick twice. I have to show them up to three times, like the identical video of the identical trick so identical presentation. And then even then solution rates are very low. It's, they hover around 20%. Um, but if part my participants manage to see through a trick, this usually triggers very strong aha experiences. And that's why I use them because I, I need to make this phenomenon of insight tractable in a laboratory. And then those are like a third key finding is that those aha experiences lead to interesting memory effects but um, for the solutions that if you understand the solution with this emotional aha experience, you actually remember it better after a week or even two weeks. Uh, so that's an, another interesting finding. Um, yes, that's, that's my perspective on uh, problem solving, creativity and magic. And I'm looking forward to discussing this uh, with the other panelists. Thank you, Amory. I'm certain that there are, there are ideas there that we're going to want to double back to during the discussion. Uh, thank you. All right, turning now to Dr. Matt Pritchard. Welcome, Matt. Hello, everyone. One of my uh, favorite books is uh, Dear Zoo. It's a children's book. And uh, just to give us a, a bit of a view here, what we've got is a uh, uh, shot here on the first page. People write to the zoo and they keep getting sent inappropriate animals. So one of them they got sent is an elephant. And I use this as a way of uh, getting inspiration. So I'm going to show a video of something that I made during lockdown. So I'm, I'm particularly fascinated by creating optical illusions and magic tricks and exploring just different areas 
of magic that uh, maybe have been unexplored by magicians before. So in uh, this little slot at the start, what I'd like to do is uh, share six insights that have almost come to me during the pandemic, because as a performer, I've not been able to uh, work in person audiences. And so I've been doing a lot of magic performance and creating through the lens. And the first ingredient is just confidence. I think over the last two years, I've really grown in confidence as a creator. And I think uh, being creative, you need to have confidence in your own ability uh, and just to be able to call yourself a magician, artist, musician, um, sets this expectation that you are going to create some new things. I love the quote from uh, Roald Dahl, the children's author, who says, and above all, watch with glittering eyes the whole world around you, because the greatest secrets are always hidden in the most unlikely places. Those who don't believe in magic will never find it. And I think when when you've got that expectation that you're going to discover something, uh, something fascinating, that's one of the key ingredients for creativity. It keeps you going and you invest both time and energy in trying to find solutions to a problem that if you didn't have that expectation, you might have given up far sooner. I think the second insight I really want to share with you is just that sense of playing and exploring and, and following the fun or following that rabbit as it goes down that hole and explore that uh, rabbit warren. I think uh, following your own interests always leads to some creative insights. And that leads on to the third ingredient. And I think to be creative, you need wide interests. Uh, if you focus too narrowly, uh, that really uh, inhibits some of the thoughts, the connections you can form. And so my interests are things like Lego, science, paper engineering, uh, loads of things like that. And that informs my creativity. And I borrow solutions from one area and apply it to another area. And I think often one of the things that leads to creative burnout is the fact that our creative input has uh, uh, much less than our creative output. We need to be constantly feeding ourselves with new ideas. Uh, the fourth idea is just failing fast. Uh, give it a go, see if it works, get some instant feedback. One of the great things of the last year is I've uh, set up a Facebook group and I've been getting instant feedback from trusted peers of saying actually you could do better or pushing me further or pointing out the flaws in my designs. Uh, a fifth ingredient is just having self-imposed constraints. So I set myself the rule when I make these illusions that I'm always working solo that I never resort to film editing or CGI or special effects. And at times I'd really want to uh, uh, break those rules, but having those constraints forces me in new creative directions. And, and the final ingredient I just want to share for now is just the power of doing the opposite. So some of you at the start will have seen my woodlouse vanish. That was me just asking the opposite question. Magicians make va elephants vanish. What would be the complete opposite? What about making a woodlouse vanish? Uh, so uh, that's what I want to share with you for now. I'm going to hand over to our next panelist. All right. Thanks, Matt. Uh, all right. Next up is uh, Cyril Thomas, Dr. Cyril Thomas. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Tony, for everything. And I invite everyone to take a look at the videos of Matt Pritchard on Instagram because they are just absolutely insane. You know, I'm a big fan of his work. And seriously, like his creativity is out of this universe. So that's it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so I'm a researcher in cognitive psychology at the University of Paris, but also I'm a creator in, uh, in magic. I create a lot of rubber band tricks uh, for two years now. And I've been a magician for 15 years. So today I will have the two sides to talk about um, creativity, hopefully. <clears throat> Probably I will talk about what is very different when we create this kind of tricks with rubber band, because what is important in magic, uh, and after it I will go back on the research part, what is very important when you try to create a magic trick is the fact that when you have an object that you want to use in an unusual way, there is a lot of constraints. Think about it, a coin, for example, a coin is a solid object, okay? So you can't, I mean, you can gap a coin for sure, but a real coin can't move, it's just normal, okay? Think about a rubber band. A rubber band is something very stretchable. So the constraints are not exactly the same when you want to use this object. And what is great with magic is that 
by knowing all the constraints of an object, you can know exactly how and what you can do with this object, or you can use this object in a different way. And what is very specific to magic art, comparing to a lot of different arts, is the fact that when you are a magician, when you want to create a magic trick, you need to find a way to diverge when you think about the function of usual uh, objects. For example, here we got a bottle of water. Okay, It's just a bottle of water. But if I ask you, OK, guys, imagine that this is not something which contains water. Okay, The first function of the object containing water, just forget it. How can we use this object for something else? So any ideas? Oh, yeah, I turn it. Sure I turn it into a bird feeder. I think. Yeah, for example. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, you, you can even smoke stuff on it, but it's not a good idea, right? <laughs> uh, but you you can also you can also use it as a speaker if you put your cell phone inside of it or whatever. Okay, there is a lot of use that you need to. But what I what I mean here is that um, most of the time we fix our mind on the first function of object. It's what we call functional fixedness, and it's pretty hard, in fact to think outside of the box, to think the object with a different option, with a different function. And what is great with magician is that in this art, magician are probably creators in magic, but it's kind of different. We'll talk about it after. Uh, but creator in magic, uh, they have to imagine, to reimagine the function of an object so outside of the box that no one can imagine that this object has been used in such a function. Okay, So that's very important. And one of my research uh, field is reasoning. So I, I work a lot on uh, cognitive biases. As you said, uh, Tony, I use magic as a tool to better understand uh, our cognitive biases in reasoning processes, low level and higher level, but also in perception. So for example, I try to understand um, how magician can use some ambiguous visual sequences uh, to create illusions. And what is interesting with human mind is that we can't we can't um we don't like ambiguity so when we perceive something as an ambiguous stimulus we have to interpret it in one direction and magicians are very good with it because they know exactly how people will intuitively misinterpret the ambiguity by simplifying some parts of it so that's another story but uh, it's one of my research gates the other one which is more linked to creativity uh, uh is my interest for this mind fixing effect so i told about functional fixedness just beforehand with the example of the bottle of water but in fact magicians are also experts to insert this kind of mind fixing effect inside of spectators brain one of the main aim of magician is to divert okay to, to to make this kind of wonder in your mind but also the aim of magician is to uh, attract your attention your representational attention away from the secret of the trick okay when you are a magician, you know this fear. You don't want people to find the secret. That's the only aim, in fact, OK? As soon as they don't find the secret, the trick is done. And you need more emotions, et cetera. But like a first step is to put the spirit and the mind of people away from the solution. And to do it, a lot of magicians use a perfect tool, which is the false solution. So for example, I just give an example like that. But imagine I have a deck of cards, and I say, OK, Tony, just pick up a card, and I will try to guess your card by reading your body language okay so give me your wrist mm, it's a black one red one black oh it's black right yeah yeah black look at me okay it's spade when you say this kind of, of general stuff you will place the mind of participants inside of this false representation of the problem inside of this false solution the he will use my body language even if i know even if i know that it's probably not true my mind will interpret this trick in such a direction the problem is that maybe the secret of the trick is much more simple. For example, maybe I use a deck with only queen of hearts inside of it. OK, so whatever. Is, OK, I don't reveal the trick, but you can force the card just easily like that. But what I say is that one of the objects, um, one of the aims sorry, of magician is to create these false representations to misdirect participants' attention on this mind fixing point and away from the solution of the trick. And what is very important is that uh, what we've discovered in one of our recent articles is that even if spectators know, they know that the representation is false, they know that the solution the magician gave to them is wrong, is not correct, they continue to search for a solution which is very close to this first re representation. So they still misdirected because, okay, I know that the source of this representation is false, but the representation has something correct. So I will continue to search in this direction. 
And this is a very good tool uh, for magician. And it is a perfect enemy for creativity because mind fixing is the opposite of divergent thinking, which is one of the main points of creativity. Voilà. And we'll talk about it later or about magic uh, with my magician side, probably during the discussion. But that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Cyril. Uh, all right. Uh, and finally, uh, let's turn our attention over to uh, David Parr. Welcome, David. Hi. <clears throat> hey. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm a little, I, I feel slightly out of place. <laughs> And that's because I, I can't bring a scientific perspective to this subject. Um, uh, what I can bring is an artist's perspective, uh, a performer's perspective, um, which, you know, to me, what's useful to me is having a working definition of what magic is and why we need it as human beings, how it works, uh, not in the psychological or scientific sense, but in the theatrical sense, by using narrative and anticipation and atmosphere and taking advantage of our tendency to um, assign a cause to an effect, even if those two are unrelated. And um, I also can bring uh, an understanding of my own creative process, how I write and develop new material. And I, I have a, a, a system that I've developed over years of doing this. And, and that system works, works well for me. Um, and, uh, and so mainly it's, uh, that I'm an idea gatherer. Um, Linus Pauling, the Nobel Prize winning chemist, once said that um, the key to coming up with good ideas is to create a great many ideas and then throw away the bad ones. And so I, I think he was right in a sense that my task as a creator is to is to come to generate ideas and then sift through them and find the ones that I can work with. Um, and um, what I've discovered is that even bad ideas are sometimes useful <laughs> uh, in, in that uh, they can either point one away from a path that, that won't be productive or surprise you by turning out to be useful when at first they seemed not so useful. So, uh, so I, I have systems I use for idea gathering, um, and that have worked over many, many years. And so I can bring that to the table and hope that that's useful to everyone. So, uh, yeah, uh, there it is. Thank you, David. I mean, you, you definitely shouldn't feel out of place here. The, part, part of the Science of Magic Association is not only solidifying those bridges that have been built between the magic community and the science community, but finding new uh, relationships between the interests of these, these disparate groups. Cool. So th thank you so much for being here. So let's uh, let's talk about a big question uh, that that I think I, I posed early on when we were talking about this panel. Uh, is there something distinctive about creativity in magic? When when we were beginning to think about the the relationships between science and magic and and early researchers like like Gustav Kuhn and Macknick and Martinez Conde were outlining some of these some of these uh, points of interest for scientists a lot of directors like film directors came out of the woodwork and said well those techniques that magicians use they're the same techniques that directors of films use to control an audience's attention and build an internal narrative uh, why should why should magicians be deified in this way? And and my initial response to this was that uh, a film a film success 
doesn't live in just one moment of effectively directed attention in the same way that a magic performance does. If a magician fails to control an audience's attention, they're dead in the water in a way that is qualitatively different from film directors. Uh, I wonder, so so what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I, maybe I'd like to first hear from um, uh, Cyril, since he is both a, a scientist and a creator of magic, is there something distinctive about creativity and magic as compared to creativity in other disciplines? So I've already told about it, but I think there is two points which are kind of opposite, but very interesting. So if you think about uh, creativity in terms of creating an object, which is like uh, a gaff or a fake object or whatever, there is also in magic creating an effect. So you can create the cause or you can create the effect. There is different things. Uh, you can create a very special coin or a very special bottle or whatever, a very special cigarette. But also you have to create a very unique effect. So what is intriguing is that when you try to create a new effect, for example, um, an effect with a bottle of water or whatever, uh, once more, you have to divert the object from its first function, okay? So you have to defix your mind away. You have to think outside of the box. And for sure, innovation is a part of it, okay? When you innovate, you diverge. So you have a lot of ideas and you will pick up inside of these ideas, some of the best ones, which are combined sometimes, sometimes not, and you will converge into the best solution. It is the same process here in magic, but the problem in magic, and I think that it, it is a real expertise in magician's mind, is that they have, to reinvent a concept with, uh, that already exists. Like you have this object with its original function and how this constraint can be uh, diverted. So you, you just have to rethink the product which, is, which already fix your mind. So you have to learn how to think outside of this first function, to drop this first function, and it's quite hard because your mind wants to converge in this first function. function. So there is this trap, the first trap, and when you want to create, you will, you will feel it like, okay, I have a lighter, I want to create a magic trick with a lighter. So what can I do with a lighter? Yeah, I can light it, for sure, it's a function. But if you want to create a very good and new lighter for magic, you have to think outside of this. Okay, it is not a lighter. It is just a piece of plastic, which can, can probably contain something. Okay, that's it, with a piece of metal. And you have to reinvent the concept. So you, you have to think outside of the function, the original function of this object. And I'm pretty sure that it's very unique to this art because you have this first constraint that is very, very hard. Um, yeah, it, it is super hard to do it. And the second thing is that in magic, you have to create an effect uh, which is for sure magic, so outside of reality. So in the, when you want to create an effect, you want to create an effect in which there is no constraint. It is the opposite. So for example, in magic, you can make object levitate. So even the normal laws of physics are outside of your effect. So at the beginning, you have all this very, this big fixation on the concept, like the rigidity of the constraint of reality, but you need to construct an effect which is absolutely the opposite, which diverge outside of all the constraint of reality. And you have to combine both of these to make it work. And that's super hard. Like you have this super big constraint anchored in reality. And using this, you have to rethink so much the project and the object in such a way that it will turn this thing in a an universe of impossibility. So that's quite hard. And I think that it's the, the main originality of magic. And that's why magician, I'm pretty sure that magician are really um, most of them creators are really experts in divergent thinking because they are, they are used to this thing of, okay, I have to forget everything I know about this object. And I have just, I, I will, we'll talk about keys of our tips or of how we can do it. Right. But it's quite hard. It's quite hard. So I think it, it is one of the main originality of magic. I, I, I'd say that there's a, there's a difference. You know, every every medium has its own. Um, every communication medium has its own quirks and uh, uh, advantages and um, limitations and so on. So it's so it's it's very difficult to compare 
uh, a live uh, in-person performance medium to uh, a medium like film. Uh, it, it, they're, because each one, it, it, they're different animals with their, with their own requirements and their own um, advantages and disadvantages and so on. And, and those are, you know, up to the performer to discover. And, and so, so I, I think your answering your question is where having a working definition of what magic is, is useful because that's what, what magic provides that other art forms like film uh, and television don't provide. And I think for me, my working definition of what magic is, is that it's symbolic impossibility. And uh, it represents things that cannot exist or are so, so highly unlikely to exist that they are nearly impossible. And they, they can't exist in the day-to-day -day world in which we live. And that's what magic gives us that other art forms do not, that it gives it gives us a direct experience of that mystery and wonder that comes from a thing that we know can't exist in the day-to-day -day world and film doesn't always do that i mean perhaps a a fantasy film shows us things that that don't exist in the real world but there are also films that are highly realistic so so impossibility is the hallmark of magic. And uh, so, so I think the creative goal is different from the goal in film. Um, the, the creative goal is to symbolize an impossible thing. And, and, and then with no intervening thing directly provide that to the audience. Um, there's no, there's no projectionist. There's no anything between the, the, the impossible thing and the audience's experience of, of that symbolic impossibility. So it's a direct experience of mystery. And uh, that's what magic provides. I mean, I mean, ultimately, I think that's why people are buying the ticket to my show. Um, so, so the creativity has to be turned toward that. And, and so that's, that's different from, from any other art form. Thank you. Yeah. I, that I, I, I'm picking up what you're putting down, David. <laughs> I think, I think I agree with you on all of those points. Not that it matters what I believe. So Cyril dropped this hypothesis uh, that I don't think anybody has directly dealt with are would magicians be better at the classic divergent thinking tasks? Amory, to your knowledge, has anybody explored uh, divergent thinking in a sample of magicians? I'm not aware of any studies. Um, it's so hard to get magicians, uh, well, as collaborators, maybe not, but as study participants, I mean, they they don't come for, I don't know, $10 per hour, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that uh, severely restricts uh, studies on magicians, uh, on magician samples. But I'm not aware of this. <laughs> True. So uh, so what do you see as, oh. the, as being, oh. Uh, sorry, sorry, you sorry, just, so, sorry, sorry, just to bounce on what you said. Uh, so there, uh, there is studies. And in, in these studies, we, we know that uh, for a normal person, uh, when, when you expose them to magic tricks, when you teach them magic tricks, just after it, they are better in divergent thinking tasks. Uh, because probably when you learn a magic trick, it changes the way you represent the world. So one of the hypotheses is that when you are exposed to magic, even if you watch Harry Potter, okay, they, they, they've run the same experiment also in, in children, when they see this magic in the movie, um, in some extent, they think the world with something bigger than the usual constraints. There is no gravity anymore, okay? So if you think 
your world by pushing the walls, you will have different ideas for sure because you diverge in a world of impossibility with no limit, which is not limited to the other constraints. And that's an hypothesis. Maybe it's something else also. Um, but if, so if magic can, uh, in some extent, improve your divergent thinking as a normal person, non-magician person, I'm pretty sure that probably magicians which perform magic all the days should have a kind of cool score in divergent thinking. It's just an hypothesis, but it should be true, probably. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think uh, I'm speaking off the top of my head here, but I think Tong Li has recently published some data showing that a, a magical intervention with, uh, with design students increased divergent thinking and, and on some of the classic tasks. Um, I, think, uh, I think from my, my very subjective experience, I think I would, I would say that magicians are sometimes the most creative and also some of the least creative people that I've come from. And I, uh, and I think some of that on the least creative side of things, I think it might just boil down to that sort of classic water jar test of what was it, Abraham Luchin's where you you teach people how to fill up a water jar and when they know one solution, they they stick to it. And I think often magicians we have that little extra step, don't we? We know how something can be done. And then we constantly latch onto that. And uh, uh, once we've got that one, uh, one little thing, then we shut down our thinking. Yeah, I agree, Matt. Um, I've had to, in coming up and creating a virtual show, there are many times where I was tempted to use a method that's a method I would use in person. And I've always stopped myself. I've, I've sort of trained myself over the past year to stop myself and say, no, wait, is there a method that will work specifically for the camera? And, and a method that I could not use in person. So I've, I've kind of gotten into the habit of not stopping at the method I already know and thinking past it to, well, how can I use this visual frame uh, that does not exist in in in-person performance to my advantage? And in, in many cases, I've come up with a method where it looks fantastic. It looks very, very impossible here but it, in person, it, it would look. Yeah, and I think that's my terrible. experience of uh, the last year and a bit doing uh, stuff through the camera lens. We, I've sort of found myself in the middle ground between being able to use close up magic techniques and brand illusion, uh, partly because of what you're saying, the, the, the framing of things and the fact you can have a fixed angle. It's very much like you're, uh, you're performing to one audience member on a specific seat in a theatre. And right. with that one perspective, you can do so much. And I, and I exploit that brutally yeah. and uh, yeah. end up in developing brand new techniques or at least adapting things from Victorian age illusions. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's fun in that I, I found it liberating in the sense that I could, now I can do stuff that I could never do in person. <laughs> and, and it got me past the, one of the, one of the limitations of the camera, which is if you watch magic on television as it developed over the years from Mark Wilson to Doug Henning and Copperfield and so on, um, one of the problems with performing magic for a, tele for a te television camera is that it doesn't blink. A camera doesn't blink. A camera can't be misdirected. You know, it, it gives you... If the camera is placed far enough back, it gives the audience the big picture that we don't want them to have, uh, where they can take in the entire scene in one glance rather than focus their attention on one area, right? But if I'm sitting here, like you were saying, and I'm close enough to the camera, it's as if we're sitting directly across the table from each other in a cafe say and now i'm going to perform some magic for you so all this area just outside the frame is now available to me 
for for use in method. And uh, whereas if I'm farther back, now the audience gets the big picture again. And this was a mistake I saw a lot of magicians making early on during the pandemic um, when I started watching magicians do virtual shows was they, they positioned the camera far back so they got this medium shot. And the trouble was none of the misdirection-based methods worked in that case because the camera wouldn't blink. And so, uh, so, so one of the, th you know, I, I was recording ideas on index cards and one of the things I wrote down was position the camera up close. Um, because not only does that allow me, a uh, a uh, uh, greater, uh, variety of, uh, methods, it also creates this, uh, the, a weird sense of intimacy. Because, because it does look like I'm sitting directly across from you and talking to you when I look into the camera lens. And that, that is also an advantage to my advantage, that creating that <laughs> sense of intimacy that really isn't there because this is an illusion right now. I'm not sitting directly across the table from you. Uh, so, so that's also to my advantage. Um, so, I mean, this is all stuff I discovered through observation and then experimenting with and, you know, writing down on the index cards. Like <laughs> the, the thing I think I'm hearing is that in order to sort of spur creativity, you're imposing kind of explicit constraints on yourself that help you overcome the implicit constraints, sort of the functional fixedness that you see in things. This seems like a maybe an interesting strategy for spurring creativity. Um, oh, absolutely! There are many, many examples of that. I mean, one of the one of the ones I I actually talk about in Magic Lectures for Magicians is Terry Gilliam is making the the movie, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, and he reaches the point in the filming schedule where they're to, to, about to do this scene that takes place in the belly of a whale. And, and there was basically going to be this guy who lives inside this whale. And there was going to be this scene with all this furniture and stuff set up inside the belly of this whale. But he, he had run out of money. And, and so he, he, he just literally could not film the scene. It was impossible. So that limitation spurred him to come up with a completely different scene. So, so imposing limitations can be, can spark creativity. Um, and that's, so fully understanding the parameters of the, I mean, here we're getting into problem solving, right? So fully understanding the parameters, what are my limits and, and how can I either push past them so that I can, I can go beyond the limitation or turn the limitation to my advantage? Uh, it was just, I think about it right now, when, when I try to create something, it's like what are, one of the important points is to decomposing everything. So imagine, I, I, I see it like a forest, so you have a lot of constraints when you want to create a trick. So you have your aim. I want to make a lighter disappear or whatever. Okay, you have your aim. And between the initial points and your aim, there is a lot of constraints. And this, these constraints are like a forest. And what you have to do here is just to see which tree you can just make disappear. Like, for example, what, what should I respect? If I, want a lighter to, if I want to make a lighter disappear, I need to see a lighter. Okay, should I need to see all the lighter? No, I just need to see something which look like a lighter for people from their perspective. So as a magician, I have to inhibit my perceptual intuitive processes, such as what we call a model completion. So the fact that if you see a part of an object, you intuitively complete the object uh, and that's intuitive. But yeah, you know that what I have to respect is people have to see what looks like a lighter. So the face of a lighter or maybe the side of it, not the rest of it, just a part of it is enough. That's a constraint that I have to respect, okay? 
maybe there is other constraint. Maybe I want my lighter to light. Okay, so if I want to respect this constraint, it is another tree that I can push up. Okay, I, I need to respect this one. But there is a lot of other constraints that I don't need to respect. For example, uh, should my lighter be full? No, it can be empty. Okay, that works for me. Um, et cetera, et cetera. And when I talk about discount putting, I have, I have a very good example just to illustrate this point. Um, imagine a color change. You know, people love color change in magic. You see the blue one here, the blue rubber band, and boom, it becomes green. So that's a color change. People think the color change as the aim, but you can decompose it as something else. A color change is not a color change. No color change exists in this world. A color change is something that disappears, which is replaced by something else. And when you think about a color change as something disappear and something reappear at the same position, you just have to know how to make an object disappear and how to make an object appear at the same moment. It is not the same problem. You just reframe the problem. It is not anymore a color change. It is now, how can I make a band appear? How can I make a band disappear? And how can I combine both of them? And if I have the solution to this new problem, I have a color change. So, I just say that sometimes we just have to rethink and to decompose the process as something more simple. Like it is, it is not a color change. It is this combination. And when I have it, I just have two very easy problems to solve and not one big problem, which is very hard to solve. So yeah. Speaking of constraints, um, so what you speak of the constraints that you experience as magicians, and I, I tend to think of the constraints that my problem solvers have to relax or overcome. And that's, that's one point or one thing that I always wanted to do. I've never actually done it. So I think there are different types of constraints and some of them might may be easier to relax or more difficult to relax. So I think perceptual constraints like a, a modal completion that you just mentioned, I think this is extremely difficult to, to overcome even if you know it. It's like those visual illusions uh, so you can you see them and you know it's an illusion but you still perceive it so those constraints that are like hardwired into your perceptual system i think tricks that are based on those types of constraints are extremely difficult to debunk they may even be like cognitively impenetrable or like unsolvable and on the other hand i think there are tricks that are based just on misdirection, which if you focus your attention the right way as a problem solver, you, you are able to perceive it. So I don't know if anyone has like classified those types of constraints that magic tricks are based on. I would be really interested in that. Uh, yeah, that, that's a very good point because as you say, there is like this kind of illusion, like the frustration count illusion or this kind of very perceptual ambiguous sequences which are interpreted or simplified automatically. Even if you know the trick, uh, in some extent, even as a magician, you'd love to do it in front of the mirror because you are not fooled anymore, but you continue to feel it. Like, oh, I know that they are not all white, but when they turn like four aces, it's like, mm, I feel something. And yeah, there is something. Like, magicians love to perform in front of the mirror because they intuitively continue to feel some things sometimes. Um, but yeah, I think also it's a question, there's a lot of individual differences uh, in like, there's also a question of what you want to believe. Like, for example, uh, a lot of people want me to have the power to read their body language, because if I can do it, if I can read your mind, it means that it activates in your, in your mind uh, a world, a representation, which fits maybe with some of your beliefs or what, you what you'd love to see in real world. Uh, that could be so nice for this kind of people. For some people, uh, this kind of mind reading sequences should be, uh, how can I say it? Some people should, will probably fear this kind of thing because it, it can be uh, dangerous also. So I think there's a lot of individual, individual differences uh, concerning the, I want to believe in this bad solution so, so bad that I, I continue to believe in it even if I know that it's not true. Um, but concerning like most of the constraints we, we put like fast solutions or things like that, I think that most of them play with uh, familiarity. What is important in, in magic is that every move we make, they have to look like something absolutely normal. And the more they look normal and usual and familiar, and the more people, as it is the case in the Einstein effect, 
the more it is familiar and the more you will try to confirm that it's true uh, because it is familiar. And what is familiar just activates familiar representation. And the more these representations are activated in your brain days after days, and the more they are hard to abandon uh, because they have been activated so many times. So I think that what is important for magician is to target what kind of representation are so familiar, so well activated in people's brain that it's super hard for them to deactivate this representation because every day they are activated. And you just make this little reactivation of something already pre-activated in their mind and in their expectations. I think it's a, it's a key point of it, but I have no more answer for it. Yeah, but it's an interesting point, absolutely. It feels like we've been we've been bringing up um, false explanations a lot uh, without actually hitting it hard during this discussion. So it might be time for us to to hit that topic hard. It's coming up a lot in the chat. Um, magic theorist uh, Daryl Fitzky said that uh, the magic. I'm paraphrasing. The magician's job is to tell the spectator what their senses are bringing them in such a way that it allows the magic trick to occur. So I think we're we're always engaging in this kind of um, um, false solution. We're, we're, we're always handing the audience a way to interpret their sensations in a way that allows the trick to occur. But it also feels like these fall on a continuum with like sucker tricks on one end of that continuum, like handing people this explicit method that seems to be underlying the trick just so you can pull out the rug, pull the rug out from under them versus on the other end of the continuum, just our constant use of narrative. And David, the way that your stories build up this internal representation that allows the audience to be duped. So for example, Stu has asked, how can you fix a spectator's perspective uh, to inhibit their creativity? So Cyril, would you mind telling us about some of the work that you've done on that topic? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think there is hundred ways of honestly to fix participants' minds. Uh, just tell them the stories they want to hear, to hear, sorry. And also, just once more, exactly, exactly what I stated, but um, the more it is familiar and the more it will work. But even if it's not familiar, even if the solution you give to them is not familiar, just imagine it as, um, imagine it as a space of representation. So for example, imagine we have a big circle here, and here we have the secret of the trick. Okay, What you want is to put participants' mind away from this circle, far away from the circle. So you just activate a representation in this direction, okay? It's great. It's very far away from this one, and the more it is, the more there is distance between them, and the more it will be great for you. Even if you deactivate the central dot, which has activated other representation here, it will continue to happen. One example of one of my studies, which is very simple, we had this card trick. Uh, I, I don't have any card, but I will ask you to represent it into your mind. Uh, so I have a deck of cards with a queen of hearts. Probably it was not a queen of heart, but whatever. You have a queen of heart. I turn the queen of heart face down, and I do this move. Then I show that my hand is empty, and I produce a queen of heart from my back pocket. Oh, yeah, and beforehand, I said to my spectators that I will try to make this card magically travel from here to my back pocket, OK? So there is a queen. I just pretend to palm it. I show my hand empty, so I haven't palmed anything, and I produce it from my back pocket first version of the trick. For the second version of the trick, I don't activate this false solution. It is a false solution, <laughs> and I prove it because I show my hand empty. In the second version of the trick, I turn it face down, I snap my fingers, I don't pretend to palm anything, and I produce the card. And what we discover is that in the palming version, even if this false solution is directly deactivated by showing my hand empty, a lot of people struggle to find out the secret of the trick, which is very much more simple than a palming action. The fact that I have a queen of heart on the top of the deck and a duplicate queen of heart on my back pocket. It is very simple, but a lot of people from this representation fail to find the trick. And our hypothesis here is that even if they know that the palming action is not correct, we know it because none of them propose this as a solution. They just say, I don't know. And it works probably because even if the palming action is incorrect, this palming action has activated a lot of peripheral representations, such as, OK, so the queen of heart is unique. The queen of heart will be will travel from A to B thanks to an occluder. And at the end, OK, it is not the end. 
it is not the hand, but the fact that the card is unique, that it will travel physically thanks to an occluder, this reality is still possible. Even if the palming action is impossible, everything that has been activated beforehand is still possible. So if you continue to, to think and to searching for a solution inside of this constraint here, the constraint that the card is unique, et cetera, you will struggle to find out the other solution of the duplicate card, which is not in this representation of a unique queen of hearts. Okay? So that's an example of it. And, but yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that the more people are engaged and inside of a representation, the more a representation is activated, the more it will work. And to do that, I think that the more it is familiar for persons, the more it is intuitive for them. Like intuitively, this is logical. Intuitively, I can say that it's not logical, okay? So I have to believe in it. So make everything, just touch the intuitions of your spectators and try to prevent them from overthinking in an analytical way. That's why we love to talk. That's why we love to give them everything. So no, don't take time to think. Just, I, I count my story, listen to me, and that's it. And just follow the story. So yeah, that's the point, I, I guess. Yeah, I the the tool I use most often to distract people from analytical um, attempts to reverse engineer magic is narrative. I, I find that the th the theatrical or dramatic level of magic is where those people can be people who tend to be puzzle minded. Um, like there, there tend to be two types of people in the, in the audience at any magic show. And those are the, the people who are able to just sort of shut down the analysis and give themselves over to the experience of mystery and enjoy it for that. And then there's the puzzle minded people who see everything as a problem that demands a solution. And, uh, and they tend to look at almost everything that way. And those people, to get those people to leave that behind, to abandon the puzzle mind, I find narrative is the most effective tool because human beings are just programmed to respond to, to stories. That stories are how we understand the world around us and our place in it. And so, it's, it's almost impossible for a person to not become engaged by a narrative. And so, so even those puzzle-minded people can be persuaded to let go of the puzzle mind for a, for a time um, if, I, if I engage them in a narrative. Isn't that like a sort of verbal misdirection? Sure, yeah, 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 it is um because because it's it's hard to do both it's hard to to be involved in the story and at the same time trying to reverse engineer something i i i think honestly that's why i fooled pen and teller when i was on the show fool us was because the the even though there wasn't speaking uh, um much speaking in that routine i performed the back and forth game with the two decks of cards and the bell, the game functioned as a narrative. Like we don't know where the game is going. So we're engaged in, well, how does this, how is this going to turn out? And by the time the game ends and, and the matching cards are revealed, it's now too late to reverse engineer what happened. It's, it's too difficult to remember all the steps in the right order. And I think that's exactly what happened. I think they they got engaged in the narrative, and then at the end, it was too late to to reverse engineer it. So I, I only have to misdirect them the the puzzle minded people for just that short time, and then it's then it's extremely difficult to backtrack. So the the techniques that you're using, David, and the techniques that Cyril talked about, those seem to really be exploiting higher level cognitive function, like event perception, the way we construct an internal narrative to explain what we're watching. Whereas a lot of the assumptions that uh, Dr. Pritchard exploits in his online videos seem to be seem to be taking advantage of these what. Amory referred to as sort of implicit assumptions about the world, these very low level perceptual assumptions. Matt, would you be willing to 
tip some of the assumptions, the faulty assumptions that people are making when they're watching your kind of forced perspective videos? Yeah. So, so I uh, talked a bit about how so much of my stuff exploits the fact a very specific angle and the field of view. But uh, another one is we, we often watch a magic show and assume it's happened once. And the reality is a lot of my tricks are filmed 40, 50 times. And I have picked the best video of those 40. And so there's sort of for magicians who are watching, it's, it's a little bit like a multiple outs. I, I pick the best result. I cherry pick it. And so some people look at it and go, that is impossible. That's split second. I can't believe you did that. And, and there's an element of me designing the illusion that way. And so I, I'm aiming towards that but I'm not very precise. And I use the, the illusion of a pre-recorded video to, uh, to, to pick the best one. And because I'm filming it myself and I have no cost of a camera crew or a studio hire, I can afford to spend two evenings recording, recording, filling up my camera with uh, uh, many hours of footage to then pick, pick the best one. And uh, that's, that's another, another assumption that I, I remember reading ages ago, Michael Close in his worker series, he talks, there's a lovely essay about the assumptions you make about how the, the magic show hasn't started and the magic show's finished. And I think uh, uh, this is another assumption that it's a one-off performance. No, it's uh, lots of performances. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, part of, part of where acting comes into magic is, is to create the illusion of the first time. And it, just exactly what you were talking about just now, in, in that I have to make it seem like from from the audience's point of view, this has only happened this once, and it might never happen yeah. again, <laughs> right? And it, and if I can do that, it's it makes the thing seem miraculous rather than the result of m much I invisible rehearsal. Which is one of the reasons why people say you should go and fool us sort of, for Ben Teller. It's like, I can't because uh, they'll be there a week filming me. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah. uh, I think getting back to another point is uh, sometimes magicians are asses basically, and they come across and set themselves up as this smug git of uh, I'm going to fool you. I'm, I'm, I'm cleverer than you. And I think one of the approaches I try to take, and this comes from my background working in museums of, we were very much taught to be when we're on, on gallery to be a facilitator of, we, we never stand between the, the member of the public and the exhibit. We're sort of side by side with them and we're there to guide them and to point out, this is cool. And I'm enjoying it as well. And I'm we're learning together. And I think uh, I try and set up so much of my stuff going, I find this fascinating. This is wonderful. Come and join me and come and see this. Uh, and I think that helps. I think when you when you have that super ego wanting to show off, then a certain class, as, as David said, a certain class of people want to uh, want to instantly engage in puzzle mode or instantly want to cause the magician to trip up and i think by having that side by side approach uh mm. dissipates that uh that adverse uh, i can't say the word predator prey someone said in the uh, the comments uh, ad adversarial uh mm. attitude we have yeah yeah for sure because yeah. because if you if you engage the audience as collaborators in this process they're less inclined to want to, to want to catch you out because they're they're equal participants in in this experience so it, it completely di it it diffuses the adversarial uh, aspect of magic the sort of the the challenge aspect of it catch me if you can kind of aspect yeah. that's not the frame of mind i want my audience to be in I mean, there are moments of mischief in my show where I do sort of wink at that kind of thing, but but they're they're very judiciously deployed, <laughs> and uh, and otherwise, I want the audience to feel as if they are my collaborators in this 
experience. Yeah, but I often see that in my participants' reports, they they take like this adversary um, uh, stance, and then they say, "Oh, when I solve it, I feel like I can do anything." And this guy with his grin, I won like something. I defended. <laughs> so yeah. it's really it's sometimes they're getting really competitive. Uh, and that's also what yeah. motivates them to go on. Like, yeah, okay, yeah. next time he's not gonna get me. And that's really funny, but I understand why you don't want that uh, uh, as, um, as a performer. Yeah, well, to some people, to a certain personality type, the fact that they're fooled means that they're a fool. Yeah, yeah. And they, they don't want to feel that way. So they go into the show with, with their arms crossed and their defenses up. They, because they don't want to be made to feel like a fool. Uh, yeah. So I, I think the, the magician's task then is to, is to get across to the audience the sense that the reason this stuff fools us is because we're intelligent. Mm. <laughs> That's why it fools us, because of the higher functioning stuff going on in our brains. That's what makes magic happen. If if we were too stupid, we would be too stupid to perceive that magic had even happened. I mean, uh, the, uh, magic, uh, as opposed to like other forms of theater, requires a special kind of attention, because because if we don't perceive the setup to the magic effect, if that somehow passes us by, um then then no magic happens so so the the brain is engaged in a special way with magic and i i have to convey that idea to my audience that this none of this is based on my taking advantage of you because you're stupid <laughs> I, so I suspect uh, at next month's webinar, uh, Jason Lettington and Teller will talk about this this very point that um, that if a person legitimately believes in magic, then a conjurer's demonstrations are not awe inducing. If everything's possible, yeah. then there is no magic yeah. anymore. Right? Yeah. Well, then we we're back to the definition of magic as symbolic impossibility. Yeah. Impossibility is the hallmark of magic. And if it, it, yeah. if it can't, if the effect I perform is not impossible, it has to be so unlikely at, and improbable as to be miraculous. Mm -hmm. I just thought about something, uh, linking my research is, uh, sorry, yes, with Amory research is, so what we know about the famous AHA effect is that when you have this insight, this AHA effect, uh, with this AHA effect, uh, it's easier after to memorize uh, this solution and you, you will have it more activated in your brain. So magician try to prevent spectator to having this AI effect on the secret of the trick. But if you want to create a strong fixation effect, you can create this AHA effect on the false solution. So it's exactly what happened when magician pretend to fail a trick and like participants think that they just spotted the trick like, oh, I know, I know exactly how you did it. It creates this kind of AHA effect inside of their brain. So it's so hard for them when they know that it was not true. Imagine how hard it is to abandon something that you are so proud of it. You know what I mean? <laughs> how can you be motivated to abandon something that you just found out by yourself and you were so proud of it? It's the same with this kind of illusion. Just one second. You see, it is linked here. It looks impossible. <laughs> Link a rock band like that. And a lot of people say, oh, there is a knot. And you say, ah, oh, come on. <laughs> and, and at the end of it, you just, you just take the knot like that. And you just put the knot off of the, <laughs> of the band, and it's like what? Like oh, it's French, but yeah, what? But it actually this kind of eureka, like oh, I know, I know, there is this kind of knot, and yeah, I spotted it just under your thumb. I know you did it, and you know how can you abandon this kind of thing? You are so proud of it's so activated in your brain with such a pleasant feeling. It's hard to abandon this feeling again. So that could be interesting to investigate in what extent false solution activated with an aha effect comparing to with less aha effect. Uh, would fix more than mine comparing to the other one, I guess. 
Yeah, yeah, we, we yeah. call this the false insights. And, and that's actually like the topic that I've been working on. Um, and it's it's really interesting because people cling to their false insights. They're not willing to give them away. They're like, no, I this is the solution. And it's, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it can't be that simple. It must be something mm -hmm. like the, something really complicated that I just made up. And it's completely implausible, but they want to believe in their own false solution if they had an aha moment when they got it. Uh, if not, yeah. it doesn't. But if it comes with this emotion, uh, they get very attached to it. And, and I think that's a really interesting um, topic to pursue. Yeah. False yeah. I, 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 my Halloween show uh, ends with a seance. And during the seance, the table levitates. So we're all standing at a table and our hands, are, our fingertips are resting on the table. And suddenly the table starts to move and it rises up off the floor. And I remember there was a show where a young woman was sitting to my right. And after the, after the seance at the end of the show, I could see on her face, she had this smile. And it's the smile of someone who has a theory. And, you know, you learn to recognize it. And I recognized that expression. And I said, what is there? Is there something you want to you want to tell us? And she was like, she, she looked a little embarrassed. And then she said, can I put my hands under the table? And I was like, have at it. So she she extended her hands under the table and waved them around a bunch. I don't know what she thought she was looking <laughs> for, but she waved them around a bunch and ex and encountered nothing. And then she withdrew her hands, and you could see you could see on her face that the theory she had was dead. <laughs> and uh, and so I just said anything, and she just shook her head. And and. And the and the audience got a real kick out of it, um, but but I was like, you know, my job my job at that point is to not make her embarrassed by having shared her theory, but but to to, to but to maybe get other people to share their theories, right? <laughs> so now I throw it up open to the room. Does anybody else have a theory about what just happened? And uh, you know. I've had magicians say to me after shows like that, why did you do that? Like, they're, because because they're afraid of what the theory is going to be. They're afraid of the theory someone's going to voice because it might be the right theory. But But to me, it's like, at that point, I don't know, let's play this game of theorizing and just see what happens. I mean, if someone comes up with the right solution, they're not going to know, right? So, so it's just going to be buried among all the other theories. Mm -hmm. So I, it uh, doesn't matter. I've uh, recently started doing that a bit with uh, a lot of my videos. Have just set them up as like, what do you think to get some engagement? And there's one I did uh, last month, which started off as something that was a quite a weak magic trick. But then I revealed how it's done with a really elaborate, rude Goldberg type of machine uh -huh. and uh, and then sort of started eliminating some false solutions of going. Some people think it's this. Some people think it's that. Uh, then show like uh, the same effect, but under test conditions and then open up the comments. So what do you think? Put it in the comments and then play that game and respectfully comment on people's uh, uh, thoughts. And I'll. I'm not going to play it now because of time, but what I will do, if anyone's interested afterwards, I'll just put it, uh, put it in the link. It's uh, with some uh, Jenga blocks, and it's it's quite interesting because again, it moves away from the usual techniques magicians use for these effects. Yeah, wonderful. When we, when we were doing our show in Chicago, we would, when we were working on new material, we would get it to the point where we wanted to test it, and then near the end of our show, we'd say, hey, if if you're willing to stay an extra 10 or 15 minutes, we'd like to show you something we're working on that no one has seen before. Uh, if you have to go, thanks a lot for coming. But if you can stay, you're going to get to see this thing that, that we're trying for the first time. And what we've discovered was that most people stayed. 
so we would perform the new thing that we were working on, and then we would ask them three questions. And the questions were, um, do, uh, did it fool you? Do you have a theory about how it was done? And was it fun? And those were our three questions. And again, I have magicians say to me, why are you doing that? Like, and it was again, because they were afraid of what the answers were going to be. But, but to me, it was like, there's no, there's nothing that someone could have voiced that wouldn't be educational. <laughs> so, so it was well worth doing. And there were, there were instances in which we performed something that fooled them, but in our effort to, um, to uh, allay every suspicion and and uh, kill every theory about how it was done, we had so overthought it that it wasn't fun anymore. We had we had, in our effort to make it impossible and building layers and layers of impossibility on it, we had made it so laborious that it wasn't entertaining anymore. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of effects that we we ended up dropping that we had worked on for months, and it was because they their answer to the last question was it wasn't fun. So so it's the creative process is loaded with surprises, <laughs> and and to, to me having that that you know sort of works in progress approach where you just put it out there and then ask people what did you think what was your theory i mean and if they come up with it, the right one if they voice the right one then we know we have to somehow kill that theory and uh you know so all of that all of that information was educational Yes. So if you want to succeed in magic, you have to fool people and they have to like it, but maybe right. not in equal amounts. And right. you have to, it's a delicate dance. <laughs> All right. right. Yeah. So if, if it's, it's no good, if it's no fun. <laughs> that's right. Okay. So here I, here I come as the wet blanket. Uh, this has been a great conversation, but we are over time. Uh, and so uh, uh there were a lot of great, great questions in the chat that we couldn't get to. I apologize for that. There were lots of great links that came through the chat. Well, uh, my friend and yours, Dr. Matt Tompkins, will be putting together an annotated version of this uh, this webinar that we'll be posting on the website in the next week or so. And you'll find all of those links that showed up in the chat and maybe even more links. Uh, so you can keep learning even beyond the, the hour and some change of this presentation. Uh, so I would like to thank our speakers. Uh, thank you, Amory Danik. Thank you, Matt Pritchard. Thank you, Cyril Thomas. And thank you, David Parr. This has been a great conversation. And